Led forth. My name is Daniel Vallis and welcome to our channel. We are in the month of Judah, in the month of Kings, and in the month of Redemption. And we have powerful pictures of redemption, particularly our redemption, pictures that we are told to look for and consider. We are also in the morning, in a time when our Redeemer has told us to be watching for him. And we have also seen so many other geopolitical and celestial signs telling us that this time is very important and that sudden destruction is coming and is very close. We are in a time that commemorates what happened the first time Christ came and redeemed us. And so we are also looking for him to appear the second time considering what happened in this month of redemption. And again, we have to consider there is not one single day we are focusing on here because it's a tapestry of events. It's really all connected events overlapping to create multiple pictures of redemption in this time. This is an entire month of redemption, and that's why even the Hebrews view it as a month of redemption from early on, because of all the pictures that are in this month. And so we continue with the remembrances and the commemorations because the story is not finished yet. The pictures and shadows of redemption in this month take up almost two-thirds of this entire month. And so we continue remembering these pictures because the story gets better as it goes forward. The story keeps going and it's an unfolding story. It builds upon itself as it goes forward. And these pictures are also carried over to the bride and the redeemed. And so we need to consider them and keep them in mind, even though what the world often views as the major points during this month are past, the story still goes on. And this entire month is a month of redemption. And one thing we have to keep in mind with this first month of the year is that it's a tapestry of redemption. It's not just one or two odd events here or there that just happened to occur. It's a continuing story from day one, literally, that progressed for most of the month. And so this is why we have to continue remembering where we are right now. We're in the month of redemption. We're in a story that is being told in this month. And there are parallels that were used with our redemption as the Bride of Christ. Our story is not finished yet, and we still see the story of the tapestry of redemption this month still going on. And so we have so many reasons to be watching. And especially the more as we study it, we see the depth and the correlation and parallels with our story. When we study the story of Exodus, it covers chapters 12 through 15. It's a continuous story spread out across multiple days but it takes up most of month one this one single story on the first day is when god told moses and aaron to make that the first day of the first month of the year and then all the appointed feast days would be pegged to that but then he gave them instructions of what would happen in just a few days ahead of that and so the story starts on day one and then Moses told the elders of the people the instructions about the Passover lamb and what the people had to do and what was about to happen. And then the elders told the people themselves the instructions and passed on and had the people get ready. So even prior to the tenth day, there's a lot of instruction given and preparation and people making plans and understanding what was coming in the days ahead, and that changed how they lived. And we have to keep this in mind. The Hebrew people knew the Exodus was coming up and so that affected how they lived they knew they were about to leave that meant they changed their priorities and what they're focused on and they had to go through their stuff and start packing up what they were going to carry out with them and planning for the future likewise for us too as we see our day of being led forth coming up that should change how we live now understanding that it is coming that changes how we view the future that changes how we affect what we're doing now that changed their priorities as they got ready for the events that they knew were coming up. And then on the tenth day of the first month is when they selected out the Passover lamb. They inspected it, make sure it's free of blemish. And that's when they took it into their house and they had the lamb in the house. And so again, reminding them of the shortness of time and what was about to happen. Always keeping in mind what was happening. They need to live in light of... Time is running out. They were running out of days before the Exodus came and before judgment came too on Egypt and those who were not listening to the Lord's instructions. It came on both sides. So they had all these remembrances with them in these days leading up to it. They had instructions by the elders. They had instructions by Moses. They had the instructions given by God, and that's what they were ultimately listening to, getting ready for the main events. 
and then on the fourteenth was the Passover with the blood on the door and the lamb slain and eating ready to go. And then the death angel came and they left and that started the period of unleavened bread when they were eating on their journey unleavened bread because they didn't have time for it to rise. And they gathered apparently in Ramses and then headed down to Succoth where they made the booths. And they continued their travels down toward the Red Sea, the way of the Red Sea. And it wasn't till the 21st day of the first month, that is when the conclusion of the story happened at the Red Sea, with the parting of the Red Sea. And so, again, look back. This is one single story spread out over most of the entire month. What God told them on the first day, and they started preparing and getting ready and living in light that that was coming up, that affected how they lived through the month, understanding that those events were coming. But the story was not finished till the 21st and 22nd. And then about on the 22nd is when they had the Song of Miriam. The events that happened in the days before and in the past led up to this event, which was the culmination of what happened previously. And when the crossing of the Red Sea events were finished, that is when they all sang the Song of Miriam. They sang unto the Lord. Exodus chapter 15. And we've looked at particularly verse 13. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. This is the song they were singing after the crossing of the Red Sea. After the events which spanned multiple days that led toward their redemption. They were redeemed on the 14th. There was a picture of the Passover lamb. And they were led forth that redeemed people. And it should catch our attention how they're singing to the Lord that thou hast redeemed us. Thou hast led us forth. Thou hast guided us. They knew the Lord redeemed them. They knew the Lord led them forth and they were singing about it. Verse 16. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thine arm they shall be as still as a stone. Till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. Again, a beautiful picture of all the people singing how the Lord purchased them, how the Lord led them forth, how the Lord redeemed them, and how the Lord led them forth and the people passed over to the other side, to where they were completely free and out of the Egyptians' reach. Till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over, which thou hast purchased. So many parallels with the bride of Christ as well, the bride that he has purchased. And we are waiting for the people to pass over. One day we are waiting for the heavens to open and for us to be led forth as his purchased people, as the people that he has redeemed, to where we will be free from the enemy's grasp. Ephesians 1.12 That we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. We are a purchased possession and we are looking forward to the redemption, toward the pickup, toward when we are led forth, and it's going to be to the praise of his glory. He has purchased us. He has paid our bride price. We know we are redeemed. We know we are purchased. We are waiting for the bridegroom to come and pick up his purchased possession. And one day we will sing of all that he has done for us as his redeemed people. Revelation 5, 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Just like the song of Miriam, how the people of Israel sang that song after the crossing of the Red Sea, after they were led forth, after the people that he purchased were led forth, the people that he had redeemed. Likewise, one day, the bride of Christ, one day we'll all sing of our Lord who has redeemed us, of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, of the Lamb of God that was slain on our behalf and has redeemed us to God. One day we will sing that song in this exact same parallel, realizing we were redeemed to God. We were redeemed in this exact same month of redemption. 
the same month that has the picture of Exodus, the same month that has the pictures of the Passover of the people that will pass over, who were redeemed, and with the Lamb of God. All these pictures are right now in this parallel of us singing the song of the redeemed singing the glory of God. We see this reminder also in the same month of redemption. And this is our expectation. This is what we are told to look for. The redemption of the purchased possession. We are told to look for us being led forth. And so we have great expectation that he will lead his redeemed people, that he will lead his purchased people forth in this month of redemption. There is a story in this month. It's a tapestry of redemption. Instructions given. Changes in life. Living in light of a departure. Living in light of redemption. Hearing the news. Hearing the instructions. Obeying. Living in light of a departure. And then one day that departure comes. The leading forth of the redeemed and purchased people. This is the picture. This is the shadow we have to keep in mind for this entire month of redemption. This month is an entire story by itself. When we look at the biblical calendar in comparison to our Gregorian calendar right now, we still have many commemorations. We have many reasons to keep these remembrances alive for us because the story is not done yet. The best part is still ahead. And this is what we need to commemorate. And this is why we remember the entire story at this time, particularly in light of also with the time of Christ, things he did at this exact same time that paralleled what happened in the month of redemption at the time of Passover. We have great expectation during this month and we are still expecting to be led forth, the redeemed and purchased people. When we look on the timeline, we have been following the celestial signs and the instructions of when we should be watching and looking and the different celestial signs we've been going forward as the redeemed we are waiting to be led forth across the Red Sea, across the final mile that will finally get us out of the enemy's grasp. We are waiting for the crossing of the heavenly sea by the one who walks on the sea, our Redeemer, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And so again, when we compare what happened at the time of Exodus, and then how Christ also fulfilled those same patterns and pictures and took it to the next level, redeeming his bride, we need to keep all these shadows in mind. This month is so important to the Bride of Christ, the Redeemed, and we are expecting our redemption. I have updated the timeline study notes that are in the triumphal entry notes. So definitely download that. I've been able to squeeze in just a few more days, and that gives us a further picture all the way to the completion of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the crossing of the Red Sea, and other events to help us keep in mind the pictures that happened in this month of redemption. The multi-layer events and stories of redemption, of redeemed people, of people who are purchased. And these are the pictures that we are told to look for and consider. We are to consider that we are redeemed. We are to look for our Redeemer. We are to see that our redemption draweth nigh. We are waiting for the redemption of the purchased possession. We are told to look for him the second time. This month of redemption highlights and encapsulates so many things that we are told to look for and our expectation rests in the pictures of redemption that happened in this month, in this morning time of the year. We also find at the time of Christ, and shortly thereafter really, another event recorded in scripture that goes with the same picture. And that is when Peter was freed from prison at the exact same time approximately as the crossing of the Red Sea. Very interesting picture for us to consider. Acts 12.1 now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out, and followed him, 
and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord, and they went out, and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. An incredible picture here. God sending his angel to wake up, Peter, cast on thy coat about thee, get ready, let's go, follow me. And he led him forth out of the prison, out of the chains, and through the gate through the iron gate that led to the city. Incredible pictures here for us to consider when we also consider the timing. It happened during the days of unleavened bread, which is where we are right now. And it came toward the end of that when Herod would have brought him forth the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. And so here at the end of the days of unleavened bread, not too long before he was going to be led forth, that the Lord sent his angel to deliver Peter, to lead him forth. And this should catch our attention, this picture of being led forth at the same time as the days of unleavened bread and at the end of it, too. The angel of the Lord came to him, and I always think it's so funny how he smote Peter on the side. Peter was sleeping. He was completely out. He had peace in the Lord and what he would do and that his way is perfect. So Peter was sleeping. He wasn't worried about it. And the angel had to come, and even with a light shining in the prison late at night, he still had to wake Peter up, say, hey, wake up, rise up quickly, get up. This is what we're waiting for, too. We're waiting for the call to rise up, rise up, come up hither. This is the call we're waiting for. We're waiting also for our chains to fall off. The chains that bound him down, that held him down, they fell off from his hands. We are longing for the redemption of this body from this world. We are waiting for the chains to fall off. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he gave him the instructions, Follow me, follow me. The angel led him forth. He led him through the prison, and they came to the final gate that led to the city, and the gate opened to him of his own accord. And they went out. And it is when Peter suddenly came to himself when he realized, The Lord hath sent his angel. He hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod. He has led me forth. And this is a beautiful picture for us to consider at the same time of unleavened bread. Multiple pictures, even with the church body, of being led forth in this timing. Just like Peter, we are bound in this world. We are in the prison of this world. We are waiting for the call, come up hither, rise up, rise up. We have also heard so many trumpet calls. At midnight the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. We have calls that there are instructions for us. We should be rising up. There were instructions for Peter as well. The angel did not do everything. And they were given as patterns and shadows for us. We are expected to rise up. We are expected to gird ourselves, to be awaiting our Lord. We are waiting to be led forth. We should be living like it, rising up. And as we go forward, God will open the sea. He will open the gates. He will open the door of heaven. This is our expectation. We have to follow him. We have to rise up. We have to go forward. This is what we are called to do. And it should catch our attention that this beautiful picture of being led forth and being freed from prison is at this exact same time as even the crossing of the Red Sea pattern in this month of redemption. Another beautiful shadow for us to remember at this time. We are in the month of redemption and we've looked at how the enemy knows this time is very important. And they know the importance and the correlation of the redeemed people, the purchased people, with the stories of a purchased and redeemed people, and an exodus, and being led forth, and being freed from prison. And they also know that he's coming a second time in the pattern of his first time. The enemy knows when to expect him. They also know the instructions Christ gave of when to watch for him. And so we've been watching how the enemy has underscored this entire month, because they are waiting for the Son of Man to be revealed, and to lead forth his redeemed people. They are waiting for that. They do not know the day or hour either, neither do we, neither do the angels in heaven. And we've seen a lot of the enemy emphasis on palms and phoenix and triumphal entries, and they are awaiting the triumphal entry of their son of perdition. But I've been thinking with all these pictures of the triumphal entry, and how that's definitely come to remembrance with the same pattern, and how we are expecting him the second time. What was so unique 
about Christ's triumphal entry. What made it unique? Well, it was a fulfillment of prophecy to the day. And don't let this escape you. A prophecy was given hundreds of years in advance to the day of when Christ would enter and make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The world knew that. The angels in heaven knew that. And because it was prophesied to a day, that was the main proof that he was the Messiah because it was prophesied in advance. So something to think about. Why doesn't the enemy know the day or hour? Why don't we know the day or hour? Why don't even the angels in heaven know the day or hour? You know, when you think about it, even the angels who work in the head office, so to speak, they don't know the day or hour either. Why? We can't state exactly for sure, but I highly suspect that it's because this was the proof that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, that he came on the day that was prophesied. If Satan knew the day and the hour, then he could copy that and use that as a proof that he was the Messiah as well. And I think that is one thing that God does not want to allow Satan to use. That proof of coming on the prophesied day is only for Jesus Christ the Messiah. If Satan knew that day in advance, he'd be telling all his disciples and all the world to expect him on that day. But he doesn't know the day, so he can't make that claim. He will be putting off a lot of lying wonders and great power and signs to pretend that he's Messiah, but he will never be able to say that he came on a prophesied day. Nobody knows the day or the hour, but we are given time frames to watch. We are given hours to watch. We are given right now in the morning to watch. We are given patterns of redemption to watch in consideration that we are going to be in the same likeness and pattern the redeemed people, the purchased possession, looking for him a second time. We have a month of redemption right now that we are looking at, and our attention is drawn toward, and he has told us we will know that our redemption is drawing nigh. We will see that he is nigh even at the doors. And we are told also that we will see the day approaching. We see a time here, but we will not know the day or the hour. So we need to watch. We need to watch this story. We need to study this story of redemption that happened at this time in this month of redemption. We see the enemy is also watching this time, just like Herod, looking at this time, giving great expectation, pointing their disciples toward this time, because they are expecting sudden destruction to come. They know it's coming. That's also prophesied. We've heard the prophetic warnings. We know that's quickly coming. And we're also told that we will see things beginning to come to pass. We can see things in the near future that highly appear to tie toward the sudden destruction. And we see even the geopolitical events now quickly ramping up that seem to be matching and leading up toward those events too. There is a lot we don't know about the future, but we can see things beginning to come to pass in the future that the sudden destruction is about to come. We are at a time right now with so many patterns and appointed feasts and we have to always keep in mind all these patterns that we're covering, they're only shadows. We do not know the day or hour ourselves. We are looking at this entire month. We are not focusing on a day. We're looking at this time because it matches everything he has told us to be watching for and studying. And so that's what we're going to do. Always keeping in mind that what has happened in the past with these events and also with even the appointed feast days, those are all only shadows. They are not prescriptive. Let me repeat that again. They are only shadows. They are not prescriptive. The shadow and the fulfillment are always separate. When we look at a shadow, there are certain things we can tell about it, but only vague details. A shadow does not tell us much about the body. My shadow, you can tell I have two arms, I got a head, I got five fingers at least. It doesn't tell you a lot of other details. What color I am, what color my hair is, color of my eyes, how many other fingers I got. There are so many details that a shadow does not have. But a shadow only gives you a hint of the body. But the shadow is not the body. And this is one thing that confuses a lot of people with prophecy. They look at the shadows and they think that the body has to fit within the shadows. No, the shadow and the body are not the same thing. The shadow points toward the body, but the shadow is not the body. Colossians 2.17 Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And Paul is telling them, 
all these things with the appointed feast days and other things given in scripture those are only a shadow of things that will come but the body is christ the shadow and the body are separate hebrews chapter 10 he goes more in depth on it of how the law itself is only a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things and he's explaining to him there's the shadows of the sacrifices and the pictures that they rehearse those are only shadows those are not the image of the things that will come and we've also talked about how in hebrews 9 he explains how christ the body the fulfillment of that shadow he fulfilled the shadow of the day of atonement at a different time of the year and this is one thing we have to keep in mind a lot of people try to focus on the appointed feast days and say oh an appointed feast day that means it's a schedule that that is when christ will come back or christ will do this no that's an appointed day for the shadow when is the shadow going to be rehearsed the shadow and the body are not the same thing and scripture shows us paul tells us and even christ showed us that the body can fulfill the shadows at a different time the body does not fit into the shadow the shadow points toward the body the day of atonement was fulfilled at a completely different time of the year on a directly 180 time of the year as well because the body when it fulfills is going to be taken to a much higher level than the shadows and so this is what we keep in mind when we look at these patterns and these shadows that's what they are they are shadows we don't necessarily get locked into the day we look at the day and the timing especially in relation to other things but we always keep in mind that the fulfillment the body when it comes will be larger in fulfillment than the shadows so we look at these shadows and we know that likewise like that shadow but not exactly like that we will be led forth as a redeemed and as a purchased people too we look at that shadow it's a foreshadow but we definitely know it's not going to be in the exact same way same with so many other prophetic events these are shadows that we look towards and we study but we understand the body and fulfillment will be separate if you haven't yet watch our exodus 2 video the redeemed possession to learn more about the parallels of how christ came to redeem a purchased people how he came to bring salvation and this is the picture that we keep in mind we also see in the shadow of peter being freed from prison we have been freed from the power of sin from the power of death when we put our faith and trust in jesus christ and one day just like peter we are awaiting the redemption of our body from this world when we'll be freed from the shackles of this world and we will be led forth out of our egypt away from our chains away from our slavery to where we are free from the enemy's reach we are a redeemed people when we put our faith and trust in jesus christ and we put our trust in him to be our mediator we become part of his bride and we have the similar instructions that peter had we have heard the trumpet calls at midnight we need to rise up we need to trim our lamps we need to make sure we are purifying ourselves and preparing ourselves casting off the works of darkness and putting on the armor of light and rising up and going out to meet our bridegroom this is what he wants us to do he wants us to rise up he wants us to go forward understanding that the end of the story is when he will open the doors when he will open the gates of heaven and lead us into the heavenly habitation this is our expectation these are the shadows we see at this time with the story of peter but also the crossing of the red sea we have so many shadows with our redemption that we are considering at this time and the enemy again is also watching this exact same time the enemy is not asleep they know peter in a sense is going to be led forth they know the bride that is awake and rising up the wise virgins they know that she will enter into the doors they also know that the doors will be shut the gates of heaven will be shut and we've seen a lot of them building with this message of them expecting the triumphal entry of their son of perdition to make his triumphal entry also tied to apollyon apollo we saw early on the connections with the bride of christ the picture that they know that show is going to happen the church is going to fall away first they know doors in heaven are going to open this is the picture they are putting out they know it's time they know it's prophetically the time to be watching and so we've been looking how during this whole time of expectation they've been calling their disciples to be watching too with the pictures of gates and triumphal entries but also the gates of heaven the gates of paradise and the gates of hell 
They've been pointing to both pictures. Because they know gates are going to be opened. They know doors are going to be opened. And they know this is a time to expect them to happen. The time when the shadows of gates being opened. The time of the Red Sea being opened. To lead forth redeemed and purchased people. This is the time. They know it's time for the church to be redeemed. And right now they are underscoring this whole month with the arch in Florence. and talked all about that right in line with the fountain right there with Neptune rising up through the watery gateway. They know this is a time of expectation. And we see in a couple of days, five months to September 23rd. We don't know if that's reference to Revelation chapter 9 when Apollyon is coming up from the bottomless pit. But it certainly does seem to match the expectations of the enemy. And again... We have a question mark there because we can't state for sure, but the Bible does say you will see things beginning to come to pass. And we have heard the calls for peace and safety and so many other things leading us toward this time. And we can see this five month thing prophetically and in the time Christ said it would happen. We see that, that it appears to be in the days ahead about to come to pass. So we put that on the calendar just saying it looks like that's coming up and it does seem to match the enemy's expectations that they are expecting their Apollo, Apollyon figure, to be freed from the underground. But one thing I also made a note about that I just recently had emphasized is Apollo is associated with certain symbols. Primarily, Apollo is associated with a palm tree, which his mother Leto gripped when she gave birth to her son. And so this should catch our attention how the enemy has been using a Palmyra arch from Palmyra, the city of palms, and so it should catch our attention. A palm tree, which is the symbol of Apollo, Apollyon, Apollon, different transliterations of the same name, same guy. This is what they've been pushing. Apollyon, who the Bible says is going to be coming up out of the bottomless pit. And even today on the Isle of Delos, which is supposedly where Apollos was born, they have a commemorative tree planted there and it's been there for a long time. This is just a descendant of that palm tree, but they've always had a commemorative palm tree there that tourists still go and take a picture at of supposedly the site where Apollyon was born, where Apollo was born. This is heavily associated with Apollo, Apollyon. So again, it should catch our attention that this is the symbol that the enemy is using, and it does appear to be lining up with what scripture says about Apollyon and how he's going to be coming from the bottomless pit. Because we've talked about the arch messaging that they've been using in conjunction with the fountains, they've been pointing toward both the gates but also the gates to the underworld as well. And remember recently how Prince Charles brought a lot of media attention toward the gates of paradise, which is the gates right here. It's just what their nickname. And then they also brought attention to other doors from the same place. It should catch your attention that they are drawing attention toward gates at this time. Gates and doorways because they know doorways are about to be opened. And this was the messaging from the very first when they even started announcing the bell gate before they changed it to the triumphal gate in connection with the quatrefoil designs, the fountains as a symbol, as a gateway to the underworld, the bottomless pit, which is where Apollyon is coming from, the Bible even tells us. And then many of the locations where they set it up had that fountain there, right next to it, identical. And then identical churches at both locations too. The symbolism was very deliberate and the placement of where they set it up was very deliberate because they know their timekeeper is about to come onto the scene. We've talked about Trump's fascination with Apollo as well and how he has it painted on a ceiling along with Prometheus, just like the paintings in the library and the other locations we mentioned. This is who they are expecting, their Apollo figure. He also has Apollo in his chariot over his fireplace as well with Aurora. The enemy knows the Son of Man is about to be revealed, and then once he gathers his ready bride, then the Son of Perdition is quickly going to be revealed right after that. And he's going to come onto the scene. And we've also seen how Trump is in a lot of messaging of the Jesuit puppet getting the world ready and leading the world toward the Phoenix events, the Palm events, which appear to be the sudden destruction events. And we see events that he's connected with certainly ramping up and we certainly see the possibility of the transpiring of sudden destruction to happen very soon with the events that he has set in play. This Phoenix Jesuit puppet. And several people have commented how just the other day on the 14th, he, in his weekly address, talked about those who are left behind. And then immediately afterwards talked about 
safety and peace and this would catch our attention because these are the messages that scripture tells us we should be listening for because that means sudden destruction is coming they know sudden destruction is coming too and right now we certainly see a huge ramp up in events and multiple strike forces moving toward north korea region supposedly carl vinson's not going to be reaching there till the 25th that's what they say but we certainly see the rhetoric increasing we certainly see a lot of things being moved into position and tension ratcheting up between russia china and the united states around north korea something is going to give way pretty soon and scripture has warned us about sudden destruction we know it's coming we see events that seem to be in play that they are expecting their son of perdition they appear to be even expecting a polyon which is definitely connected to destruction there's a lot we do not know but like the bible says we will see things begin to come to pass and we see so many other things with the story of our redemption that's why we're looking at this time in the month of redemption we are looking for him to appear the second time to pick up his purchased possession so definitely download the triumphal entry notes study these pictures rehearse them continue to rehearse them with yourself and your family dig deeper into these pictures and understand the pictures of redemption that our own redemption is likened to and parallel to and we get a better understanding of our redemption when we understand these shadows as well so many reminders to be expecting our redemption by the lion of the tribe of judah in this month of redemption we are looking up we are looking for our triumphal king to lead us forth to call us forth to loose our shackles to open the doors to call us home we have heard the trumpet calls at midnight for us to rise up to go out to meet him and so just like the hebrew people who knew that their exodus was coming soon they lived in light that time was running out and likewise we can look forward to the redemption of the purchased possession by making ourselves ready by living in light of it by looking for him the second time and as we see that day approaching, let us encourage one another unto love and to good works and to help each other get ready, to strengthen each other, to encourage each other. We all need it. And like the story of Peter when he was freed from prison, the church was praying for him. And that is recorded because it's important. Your prayers mean a lot to this ministry. Your prayers mean a lot to each other. And we need to continue asking for prayer. I need strength. I need wisdom. I need safety, I need liberty, and your prayers make a huge difference in helping hold the ropes. Peter, when he was in prison, he had no idea they were praying for him, but it made a difference. There are a lot of times we don't know the effect of our prayers, but it does make a difference. As John Bunyan said, the angel freed Peter, but it was the prayers that sent the angel. We especially need to pray for each other at this time, that God will grant liberty to each other, that he will strengthen each other and that we will serve each other and that we'll rise up and that we'll put on the armor of light at this time. So let us keep each other in prayer. Ask for prayer and we will pray for you. We are called to watch. We are called to pray. We are called to be sober. So we are looking at these shadows. We are commemorating all that reminds us of our redemption and how we are purchased people. And we are looking up, waiting to be led forth by our Lord. So let us serve him first and highest above all else. Maranatha.